Hello, and welcome, everybody. Thank you all for coming to today's special program featuring writers in the just-released Blackfire This Time, Volume 2, a powerful new anthology of poetry, fiction, essays, and drama that explores the history and legacy of the black arts movement. I'm John Smalley, and I'm a librarian here at the main library in the Humanities Department. Before we get started, I want to take a moment to acknowledge our community and to tell you about an upcoming event. On behalf of the Public Library, we want to welcome you to the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramatush Ohlone, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. As the indigenous stewards and in accordance with their traditions, the Ramatush have never ceded, lost, nor forgotten their responsibilities as caretakers of this place. As guests, we who reside in their traditional territory recognize that we benefit from living and working on their homeland. We wish to pay our respects by acknowledging the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramatush and by affirming their sovereign rights as first peoples. Um, next month on Sunday, September 8th, in this very room, the library will be hosting Right Now, SF Bay's Local Color Book Party. So come listen to readings, buy books, and party with some of the Bay Area's best activist writers. Readers include James Cagney, Yasim Yolani Hakes, Susan Ito, Tarita Michael, Grace Lowe Prasad, Shizui Saigel, Kim Shuck, Kimi Sugioka, and Ma Shine Nguyen. You can learn more about uh, upcoming programs by grabbing a flyer or newsletter from the table on your right. Please do also help yourself to coffee and cookies. Uh, or you can consult the library's online events calendar at sfpl.org. So that ends my announcements of upcoming events. You are here for Blackfire this time, volume two. If you have not already read volume one, the library does have copies of that and is really one of the best books of 2022. You owe it to yourself to read it if you have not already done so. Volume two will be on sale at the table over here. Also, um, other books by today's authors will be for sale after the event. The event goes uh, from 1 till about 2.30. We're hoping to wrap up the reading portion around 2.15 so that we have time for book sales and signing and also just socializing. So do, do stay afterwards to speak with our writers. So uh, today's program has eight writers. And I wish now to introduce the first writer of our program, Lakiba Pittman is a poet, creative artist, educator, and business consultant. She has exhibited her art with the Black Woman as God art exhibits for several years in San Francisco. Please give a warm welcome to Lakiba. Okay, thank you so much. Really happy to be here with all of you. And I noticed on the website where they published a little bit about each person. I'm, I'm glad that they mentioned my uh, poetry and its link to my authentic spirituality. Uh, besides being a professor, I also teach workshops on trauma healing and a generational healing, gestational healing. And so it's a part of who I am. And my poetry comes out of my own history and that of my ancestors. So I'm going to just read a couple of pieces today. The first one is vulnerable here in this place. It's okay to stand with hearts flung open, with peepholes to our souls miles wide, to be seen for all of our foibles, not just by others, but to see ourselves and still love unconditionally, 
in this boundless space to forgive, to value, to take care of, and truly know to believe in our worthiness, belonging, accepting, trusting. We embrace and in this sacred realm, our souls interlace. When you can be soft for others and have others be soft for you, here in this place, you can flow within unity's river where knowledge and insight and wisdom and love flood the dry lands of distrust. The secret is believing and knowing we are worthy of each other's admiration. Here in this place, we connect in new places, in sacred spaces, where sweet hot waters unclench fist, release locked jaws, and soothe tight muscles, traumatized by life stressors. It is here that we release our suffering and end the inner fight. We let go of the struggle and we recognize the power of our shared light, the power of our connection, the power of relationship. And this is the place where compassion reigns. It is in this space that altars ascend, where dreams lift off and lullabies lay us down to rest, where love never dies, where safe spaces are born and sanctuaries are real and dreams are realities where I trust you and you trust me and we are vulnerable here in this place. Thank you. This one's a short one, but mighty. This is Let It Go. Who could understand what secrets we keep Yet we cry out with just a minimal touch, signaling a deep denied pain. Like quilts sewn together, we carry our broken parts. Like shattered glass under tender feet, cracked open wounds, cycles of dysfunction, and multitudes of whispers in the night. Let it go, my sister, set it free my brother. There's healing in the story being told, unbottling a lifetime of swallowed cries we hold. Let this imagined dreams unfold. Let it go. I'm still practicing that one. And uh, the last one I'm going to read is actually in our current edition of Black Fire this time. Really grateful and thankful to be included. And this is my poem, The Dreamers. Yesterday, I experienced myself anew, awakened as if in a dream, but not a dream, a reality lived centuries ago that is now intertwined in time. I see myself in the passerbys, and I hear some of my story in her story, and his story, and their story, and in yours. And just a bit of a tear wells up as I listen to the journeys of others and hear of your dreams and early beginnings. In our families, some hide the rhymes and the reasons, some sharing their dreams and a vision and hope, even when they have given up much of it, still they believe in us. We are the ones who will live a better life, and in that realization, they rest some, but work more to ensure a safer journey for us. Dreaming of our education and our growth that we will have a better life. And so, may I embody the dreams of my ancestors, igniting a spark in my mother's eyes, illuminating her soul. May my father's smile embody a thousand dreams, 
inspiring future generations under the warmest sun, that the strength of his hug remains with me throughout the years, especially on those days when the world seems resistant, in places where my light may not always penetrate or be known or recognized, where my joy is suppressed in those places where I am not welcomed. In the face of adversity, I rise undeterred. May my father's dream for me be realized as I conquer each new challenge. May my mother's dream for me broaden my heart's horizons and show me the power of self-love, self-care, compassion for others and for myself. May I remain strong. May I show up. Yes, I am because they believed in a dream that will never die, now and forever. Within their dreams, I take flight. Thank you, Akiba. Our next reader, Thurman Watts, was born in San Francisco, and in the 1970s, he co-founded the Nairobi Poets. His work appears in many publications, including the San Francisco Examiner and the San Francisco Chronicle. Please welcome Thurman Watts. Hi, everybody. So good to be here. I got to say that uh, I've never been to the San Francisco Main Library. However, in 1957, I joined the Page Street branch of the San Francisco Public Library. So it's kind of like full circle here. As a babe, As a babe yeah. <laughs> um, giving thanks to all the poets and orators who came before us, all of us assembled here today, to the editors, Derek Harriel and Kofi Antwi, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, probably not. Um, also, uh, Kim McMillan, Dr. Kim McMillan, who uh, edited volume one, which I had a short story in there entitled In Bombay's Glass. And, um, Seemed like there was one more. Oh, Heather Buchanan, thank you very much. I'm just going to read one. I'm going to read uh, the poem that I have in volume two. And it's called um, 30 African Triplets. I was born in Hunter's Point, authentically a joint in itself on the outskirts of toxicity. My middle name is a Langston Hughes character that once got his mental pocket picked as a sad young man sitting at a bar. At 16, a reading of Giovanni's Room by Baldwin prepped me for my first bad acid trip <laughs> that happened before age 20. Took that orange sunshine at college in a blessed twist of fate. My name might have been Timothy Peebles had I gone to San Francisco State. What the world needs now is a black sonic boom. I wrote to N. Giovanni. She wrote me black. My partner stole her letter. Fame is fleeting like a motherfucker. The butler of East Palo Alto did it. As fully fledged and pledged Nairobi poets, Stanley Crouch sent us a gin bottle that had no pig feet when we blew black art psalms for alms on his turf our feet on the throttle for what we had birthed. We met Eugene Redmond in Sac, Quincy Troop in Berkeley, North 
on earth. Troped troop, seek ye the reed of Ishmael? Come back after the Nazis try to claim the boogaloo. The coast might be clear then. Black arts mother, Sarah Webster Fabio, whose counsel we did covet, showered us with grace and purpose. The storm cometh, hinted she, and we smack dab in the eye of it. Caught in a Cointel Pro spell and shenanigan, they killed a girl I had for a bit. Went to the nut ward at least thrice to wit. The poets broke up, crack came from my head. I gave up my pen for a season instead. Rasta threw me a lifeline as I roused rabble. I spoke with Joe Higgs, Marley, Peter, and Andrew Tosh. Still, I continued to dabble, not to mention the babble. David Henderson brought ghetto follies to town. I took his picture instamatically. He gave me a beer for it. Knew nothing about my roomie, coked out, middlemanning a Richard Pryor deal at the start of the Is It Something I Said tour at the Circle Star, no doubt. Undercovers everywhere. Outside the crib, on the road, in the highway light, when they came from my roomie, I was on that nut ward flight. When old man death came from Marvin, I contemplated rehab, and I said, yes, yes, yes. Saw Big Mama Thornton's last gig in Berkeley at the Julia Morgan. She looked like my grandpa's voice from beyond. Black Community News Service, Fall 91. We did the 25th Panther anniversary issue. I wrote in quotes of Garvey for the people's sum. On the Bay Bridge one day, I saw Ed Bullens, handed him a one act that I never saw again. <laughs> Burst in the radio with Musica, interviewed Smokey, Mavis, and both BBs on air. T. Watts, I thought you was a white man, said Mavis, taking me there. <laughs> Ghost wrote a tune for Sly Sister Vet. They went on the road, y'all know the rest. Went to a record party. Met Sugar Pie DeSanto and senior Jimmy Moe. Defanged Johnny Talbot too at a club called Down Low. Went, went on the road with the Sugar. Chicago Blues Fest, Norway, Italy, the price of fame, the game of wages. Nonetheless, the sugar burned stages. Spoke with Master Kayla's biographer, Professor Cheers. Took me 11 years to finish you, he said. He said, brah, I don't think it took 11 years, I'd be dead. <laughs> Sojourned with Lester Chambers telling his story from life's files mingled with the retrospective vapor of Owsley, Hendricks, Betty, and Miles. So now, I wrote you, but maybe I should say, we're convinced that Pandora is a musical portal, portal and most everything is square. But my children, be not still, beware. All, prophe all prophecy is not real. Protect spirit, soul, and la familia. Be on alert for all attempts to kill you. You might miss me, though, in this super flow of this world crashing and cashing in on me, on you. It matters not who handles this business for we's through. Thank you. I say. Thank you, Thurman. Our next reader, Judy Juanita, 
helped found the nation's first black studies department in the 1960s at San Francisco State University. She's the author of several books and is a winner of the American Book Award. Please welcome Judy. Thank you. Uh, reparation, reparations approved? Yes. This came after the bill was approved. <clears throat> Dr. Phil, this quote at the beginning of it, and this is on page 15 of this great new anthology. I can tell you from a psychological perspective that if you take 350,000 or 840,000 and you write a check to any group of people, black, white, poor, homeless, whatever, you give any group of people that much money and say, there you go, best of luck. You come back in six months, they're going to be broke, he said. Whatever reparations are done, that would be an absolute disaster, as opposed to guidance and help in creating generational wealth, as opposed to income. That's from Dr. Phil. Screw Dr. Phil. <laughs> I will blow mine wisely, because the cancer of oppression goes deep. And furthermore, fuck Dr. Phil, who pimped out Oprah, made $20 million off her, and pimping out people's raw emotional trauma, and has the nerve to say blacks would go crazy if we got reparations, news flash. We already crazy. <laughs> the idea of getting our just due for the ancestors is mind boggling for us and everyone else, because the cancer of oppression goes so deep. And further, further, furthermore, if we spend every single penny of it, okay, let's say $400 billion, because 1619 to 2019 equals 400 years, on Land Rovers, Lamborghinis, Louboutin, diamonds and pearls, lavish weddings, gambling in Vegas, Macau, Monte Carlo, yachts, gold carriage funerals, mansions, lavish baby showers, the luxury life, Gucci, Rolexes, trips around the world. Why should any non-black be upset? It would make it, it would snake its way back into their pockets because the cancer of oppression goes that deep. And then, this is from um, a podcast I have on Spotify called Malik and His Family. And it, it's about um, an eight-year-old boy in Oakland uh, on the way to school every morning with his mother in conversation. And he has an older brother named Damon. Mommy, are you going to go over Auntie Pat's today after you drop me off? Uh, yes. I don't want you to go over to Auntie Pat's. Well, right now, I need to go and see Aunt Pat almost every day. Because she had cancer? Yes, because she just needs a good laugh. She needs a good friend. She needs somebody to come over and see her. Pat and I do that for each other. But, but I'm scared. Why are you scared? Oh, I know. You think that I can catch cancer from Aunt Pat? No. Well then, why are you scared? Because, because Auntie Pat lives in the ghetto. <laughs> Pat has lived there for 22 years and she knows her way around. I'm not afraid when I go over to Pat's. It actually used to be a very nice neighborhood. like it because you and Auntie Pat sit there and you're talking and you're laughing and you throw your heads back like horses and you go We don't know 
exactly that he's a robber. Um, but guys do run back there awfully fast. Right past her screen door. And she keeps her screen door open. And we can see everything from Aunt Pat's screen door. Oh, they do run fast. They hop over the fence. And then the policeman tries, but he can't because he's too fat. And then he walks back. And I hear his police reporter. And he's reporting, and it scares me. Oh, Malik, that's part of his job. No, it scares me. Then you and Auntie Pat are sitting there still laughing. And you're laughing and you're laughing. And I think he's going to be mad at you because you're laughing. And he's going to come to the screen door. Because it's so easy, it's so easy to get in. And the more you guys laugh, the madder, the madder he's going to get. And then he's going to come in and he's going to shoot us all. Oh, sweetie, sweetie. That's not gonna happen. I feel very safe at Pat's. I only go there during the day, okay? I don't wanna go there anymore. Okay, you don't have to go there anymore because it's frightening for you, but I don't want you to go there anymore either. Oh well, I'm gonna go see Aunt Pat. Why? Why? Because I love her. And I love going to see her. She's my friend. But don't you think it's not safe? Malik, there are all kinds of situations that are not safe in life. We live in a nice neighborhood, but you know what? If you walk across the street and don't look both ways as fast as people go up and down Park Boulevard right here in Oakland, it's like a highway. Bad things can happen wherever. I can't let that stop me from doing what I have to do. You have to be mindful. I go to Pat's, I'm very careful. I usually don't go at night unless I'm dropping her off. But you know, I'm not gonna live my life without laughter and love. But I'm scared, I'm scared to go there. I know, I know, but you're a little bit of a scaredy cat right now in life, okay? It's just a phase. And we're going to work this through because, yeah, there are parts of Oakland that are ghetto. Damien says, the ghetto, the ghetto. Yes, there are parts that we call ghetto. And maybe they're a little scary. I'm not going to be around them at certain times of day. But at the same time, we have to live our life each day, okay? You can stop going to Aunt Pat's for a while. We'll see how it works out, how the neighborhood changes. Because things change. But Aunt Pat needs me as a friend right now. So, so you're going to go over there as a friend. But can you close the door? The screen door? Because I think if the screen door is open, and it, you know, because it's, it's cops and robbers to you guys, but I don't think it's cops and robbers to the police. All right. If it makes you feel better when I go to see Aunt Pat, I will close the door so that the screen door, you know, so that nobody can come in unless it's with great effort. Does that make you feel better? Yes. Thank you, Mommy. Thank you, Judy. Our next reader, Eric Andrade, has made impactful contributions to the world as a father, an international organizer, poet, fashion designer, environmental justice educator, leadership development educator, graphic designer, videographer, TED Talk presenter, political candidate, disruptor of negative power, thought leader, and founder of La Soul Renaissance, Eric has presented in Standing Rock, Cuba, Canada, Cabo Verde, and all over the United States. Please welcome Eric. Thank you. Um, 
it's a pleasure to be here and to to hear the different voices. I, I, I'm honored to be here. Um, I just want to dedicate this. Uh, my daughter's turning 19 today. Um, to my daughter um, and also to the elders that got me to this point, um, Everett Hoagland and Baba Askia Torre. Um, uh, and I'll just start from there. Spiritual soldier, we learn what was lost. Spirit of Sankofa, return to the source. This struggle continues. Resist the mind virus within you. Resurrect Osiris, then open up your third eye's iris like Isis. Bring back to life the lifeless with intention and purpose to serve our children's children with words for all like Biko, Lamumba, Amilka Cabral. We call on y'all to return to the source, letting love be our force and God be our guide. Nos kunos tu junta, together we fly. <clears throat> Godly specifics, hieroglyphics written upon papyrus. I'm Solomon, King Tut, Osiris. Look within my iris when I have Isis, the others Jesus Christus. Epics like Gilgamesh. Me and Noah, we built the ark the best. Genesis, the start of thought arrival. 26 versions all in Bible. My soul survival on and on. Buddha, Muhammad, the Quran. Blessed be from Jah. In the sun, I am seeing Ra, son of Zeus and Apollo. Empty truth, it leaves a mind that's hollow. They knew testament, but forgot the time to follow. From beginning to the end, there's no sinning in the Zen. Taoist origins of I Ching. So Sojourner's truth, I sing. Listening to John Coltrane on a slow train with different stops. Reading Alan Watts, Latsu, Hebrew, Hindu, Yaya Diallo. Thomas Paine, these thoughts are hard to swallow till I see the Tai and Chi. My God guiding me to be what I'll always be the creator of my own reality. You see, lack of love of self within is the fact above original sin. Original men born with lights within, a complex thought whose sights begin and a reflection that bend back. We live inside a mirror that can't crack, creating images that lack negative pictures. Our self-portrait, it was written in scriptures with words that aren't heard, but seen in the mind of those whose visions not blurred by the unaware's false perception. Knowledge past caught within your ears reception giving birth to virgin conceptions. Immaculate search for my soul perfection, let our maps with no lost direction. You see all roads cross on a course for resurrection. Raise your force and return to light like dawn born in the death of night. Some are blind to their prison in life. They accept what they are given in sight. Trapped in a religion of a maze that turned kings into slaves by promising a heaven in its graves when its reality is risen in these days living in its Eden. Every second, our breath is leaving. So stop praying for the grace you're already receiving. Written words consumed when reading is like food for thought. And though the crew resort to cash and plastic cards, they only get Trump when reality crashed so hard. So why these often thoughts of a bastard? Your father was a son. Allah, Buddha, and Jesus, all are one. And please recall, my son, your mother is your nature. And when you hate, you hate yourself. And no monetary gains can replace your health. So existence is where we should place our wealth. And with persistence, please peep that light in the distance. It travels at the speed of thought. Ignorant minds are in need of support to realize their potential. Our body is just our spirit's residential. Mind, body, and soul, the three elemental. A holy trinity, that's not coincidental. Because I am we, we are she, and he is me, G-O-D. One love, peace, and unity. And I want to share one that I did in the book. I'm sorry. <clears throat> Where do we go when we can't afford the ghetto? From New Bedford to Soweto, historically segregated and hated, we are the blight they rewrite outside of the margins. Marginalized by institutional racism and real estate bargains, and yet if we speak of the oppression, hoping to reach and to teach lessons, we are seen as complainers that are less important. Explaining the pain away as just some vain whiners who don't take the time to divine solutions. 
Well, how about not contributing to the uprooting of community? And what about solidarity and unity? Or listening to the voice of the voiceless or not making the choice to ignore the impact on those made poor by the war on black, brown, moors, and natives? You see, genocide and gentrification are so related, they are cousins. And white fragility has me bugging. It seems so many are so upset about shame, blame, and guilt, more so than the pain that is felt when the only place oppressed people can claim is the prisons they built, like concentration camps. As so-called allies stamp us as irresponsible and negative for speaking, trying to increase awareness, yet fragility makes it hard for some to hear this. It seems so many are asleep, they must have taken a sedative. And deep is the question, so it bears being repetitive. Where do you go when you can't afford the ghetto? Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Our next reader, Tweeter Michael, is known as poet, author, story medicine woman. Her full-length collection, Synchronicity, The Oracle of Sun Medicine, was released in 2020 and was nominated for the California Book Award. Please welcome Tarita. Oh, so you have a book up here. <laughs> oh my gosh, okay. Yeah, just in case. Yeah, those of you who didn't write. Um, wow, I'm always honored to listen and take in what each of us have to offer. And being a story medicine woman, having been a nurse, worked as a lab tech in a psychiatric institution, uh, there were things that uh, really came into focus, especially when 14 Jesuses showed up at the psychiatric institution, you know, and, uh, you know, I don't know if they put them all in a room together or what they did, but I was just the lab tech, and I was, you know, drawing blood, and one of them said, you won't find it there. <laughs> but anyway, I digress, and I'm going to read, um, just honoring the Native Americans and what we have uh, gone through. It's, oh, that's interesting, I said we. Well, we all have gone through. But this is for indigenous around the world. We have sinned, missed the mark, the mark of your teachings that kill us. We should be grateful to die in light of your God's word and dishonor the heavens we witness with our eyes. Did not mean to spot your knife that cut backbone snake from body's tree of knowledge that sees where our two eyes cannot. Did not mean to smell, listen, or be aware of feet, fin, feather relatives warn us of coming fires, storms, quakes, or tsunamis. Forgive us for looking to them for protection, though they have saved us many times. Please forgive that which sustains our lives. Forgive us for being crippled by that loss. Did not mean to be aware of medicines from flora, fauna, tree, star, seed, reasoned by season. Forgive our ancestors who left us this healing speech. Did not mean to dishonor your God for our great mother, father on earth in heaven you call hell. Did not mean to miss the mark of your consent to be ungrateful. This is our sin, O oh great learned father, priest. Your guns, hangings, beheadings, and exiles from homelands have convinced us your God is powerful. 
Forgive us for judging your vicar of Christ, God's spells that tell us we must wait for your God's son to return and ignore sunlight return every day. Forgive us, for we are sure you believe your God is the only true living God and everything that has provided nourishment and protection before your arrival to our lands is evil, born of Lucifer, your light devil. Forgive us this displeasure we see in your eyes as we celebrate existence through ritual rites. So seed, harvest, dance, sing, drum, and embrace one another in presence of nun or priest, for this too is a sin. Forgive us if you do not see or understand your God's love. Forgive us if we do not see or understand your God's love. Perhaps it was lost in translation. English gives us headaches. Your words remove much from our world. We fear anger, grief, and confusion will consume our children's future. Who, like us, will be forced to believe this land is not alive and listening. Forgive the discomfort you see in our eyes for anesthetizing our flesh with pipe or drink from sacred trees that temporarily ease slaughter of our legacy, born broken according to your God's word. We have sinned, missed the mark, and instead eagerly await the fate of our Father in heaven that shames our existence on earth. Forgive us if we do not know how to deify your intelligence that chooses to house the likeness of your God's only son's murder nailed to a cross upon walls that conceal sun from sky. We hear your church say, Amen. Desert earth, woman, children, and bear witness your worship is a warship against life. Forgive us. And I am uh, going to read what's in the book and then end with a shorter piece. Um, and this is uh, the memory of working at the George Jackson Free Health Clinic. So it's in this book. The one I just read is in this book, Synchronicity. We are soldiers on the battlefield with life light in our eyes, said Sister Sonia. 1994, 23 years after volunteering at the George Jackson Free Health Clinic, the Tribune calls, ask, how many guns did you have at the Black Panther Clinic? How many guns? Not how many services were provided? Not how many programs were implemented? Not how many doctors or healthcare workers volunteered? Not even why we'd care to put into practice such a program with so many hospitals in our community. No, didn't ask any of that. Wanted to know how many guns we had not what illnesses or diseases most affected our communities or how often we screened for diabetes, sickle cell, or checked for high blood pressure, if at all, or what may have been my specialty at the time. I would have told them about certain grains to regain genetic memory, but they were more interested in how many guns we had, not who ran the clinic or what hours or days of the week we were open, or who was our hero or she wrote to set about such a task that sustains our health needs today. No, the reporter didn't ask any of that. They wanted to know how many guns we had. The revolution is coming whether we want it or not. It is coming whether we want it or not. We must be politically prepared for what is coming. 
The revolution will not be televised, not be televised, not be televised. The revolution will be live. And um, <laughs> sorry, I didn't get this version of my poem. A chunk has been removed. But um, moving forward, the ritual. And this is my last piece. It's fascinating, they removed that. Spring spiral spirits, immortal body jumps, strikes a match, ignites fire, heart, heat, moisture, release, cherries, flesh, funk, sweet swings, low, let us ride from the other side. Where metaphysical tones enthrone homes, bathe bone, call out, oh God, oh my God, on a good day. Nine moons sanctify array of sons and daughters, canonizes flesh, stone, water, seen, seen, and unseen. Heartbeats, immortality's womb, empirical loom, spherical room, lyrical tune, joy and pain. Sunshine and rain, cause everybody got a little light under the sun. Five cosines, five sisters and brothers. Math logic baptizes lives of fathers from the mother. Fibonacci wheel keeps on turning, rolling, rolling, rolling down a river, sealed in red mitochondrial reels. Mama's helix keeps us real, rocking steady. Calling this song exactly what it is, humming all kinds of medicinal lullabies up in here. Lips, nose, eyes, ears, crown, tether four extensions down. How great thou art, poets, dancers, musicians, scientists, farmers, mathematicians, paying dues, crossing toll booths, en route to mysteries, sometimes crude but adores the magic of molding hues of you, baby. Thank you, Tarita. Our next reader, Mark Allen Davis, is an associate professor of Africana Studies in Black Performance Studies, Dramatic Literature and Music Theater at San Francisco State University. He is an original cast member of The Lion King on Broadway and is an internationally recognized director, choreographer, dramaturg, and playwright. Please welcome Mark Allen Davis. Good afternoon. Um, I'm so blessed to be here. I feel awash, like showered in all this incredible healing and creativity. It's just a great honor. Um, I, this is, a, it's in the book. I, I don't want to quote which page, but um, I also, it's, a, it's a remarks that I gave at a presentation, the farewell to an artistic installation in Golden Gate Park. And I'm just gonna dive right in. Um, so why is monumental reckoning monumental? Uh, Eshofuni is a Buddhist concept, the oneness of life, in this instance, art and the environment. I was fortunate to meet this incredible manifestation of fortitude and power embodied in one Dana King, a sculptor. Four years ago, there was an immediate connection. I too am an artist. People like Dana, me, any person who has journeyed from one location of transformation to another have at stake in that great dividend of profundity, knowing that something in their lives has moved. James Baldwin wrote in 1962 in the essay, The Creative Process, there are forever swamps to be drained, cities to be created, mines to be exploited, children to be fed. None of these things can be done alone. But the conquest of the physical world is not man's only duty. They are also enjoined to conquer the great wilderness of themselves. The precise role of the artist then is to illuminate that darkness, blaze roads through that vast forest so that we all will not, in all our doing, lose sight of its purpose, which is, after all, to make the world a more human dwelling place. Regarding the Empress Dana King, she together with Illuminate have created a work that makes the city a more human dwelling place. Why is it monumental? I'll be getting to that. 
Her work in sculpture and statuary art captivates because our lives intersect on that great highway of contemplation where we reconcile the dislocations of the black body, not only in the public sphere, but also in our collective consciousness. I was on a working visit in the former Soviet Union in 1990 during perestroika. Moscow is a huge city, vast. It is over 50 miles in radius. Being driven around and witnessing their monuments was overwhelming. Not only were the roads very wide, the buildings were set very far back from the, from, uh, the roads. The monument to cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin is jettisoning upwards to a height of almost 43 meters, 145 feet. One must crane one's neck to look up at it. It dwarfs. Moscow's immensity and its large buildings and the scale of its monuments are telling the citizens something. They are telling the citizens that they are puny and insignificant, and the party is foremost. Hearing the right wing name calling the other side communists, Marxists, and the radical left is comical to me. Moscow's infrastructure was emblematic of the influence of the state to control and disempower the spirit. In this instance, the state, the Soviet government, is not illuminating darkness, but exacerbating it. Some things never change. I am the third generation on my paternal side, born free. My great-grandfather, Zachariah Davis, was born in 1847 in Lowndes County, Mississippi. My great-grandfather was the progeny of rape. I've never found it fair nor equitable that I must undergo the reckoning of this ancestral trauma alone, or that my European brothers don't have to or won't. What a great privilege. Many can't, but my father's memory and his family's told me about Zachariah. They breathed him into life for me, as well as the burden of having to learn of him. I had come to a crossroads in my personal life that forced me to address trauma, abuse, and not just in my life, but in my father's and mother's lives. They are no longer here, and I feel it's my duty to become happy. In order to do that, I have to reconcile deeply, actively, daily, that I am, not, that I am the son of America's greatest sin. I'm not the only one. I know this but I am responsible for my life. The causal acts were in place long before this nation was a nation, but I do this act of reconciling my existence. I must, it's my American legacy, my American obligation. I'm proud to do it as I know Dana King is proud to realize such a vision as we gather here today to say farewell. Fundamentally, this is my existential crisis. One recent morning, I saw a video clip of an interview with a MAGA person an elderly white woman who hemmed and hawed with da darting eyes showing she couldn't answer the question, what was the Civil War about? Unbeknownst to her, she was trampling all over my history on my very existence. The privilege of her arrogant ignorance was disturbing and monumental. Many of us are like Marty McFly in the film Back to the Future, with the sense of us simply fading away from a Polaroid as we were never here and never had been. While our compatriots have the privilege of, un of the unconscious, the unwoke, the walking dead, our ancestors are here embodied in those soon to be departed figures surrounding monumental reckoning. Alive, a light to enlighten and yes, illuminate. This is another reason why this artistic work we're celebrating is monumental. I've had to deeply reflect on the fact of my skin color as a high yellow brother affords me privilege. It also places me in a caste within a caste. This caste can be resented by some of my black brothers and sisters. It's also afforded me a proximity to racism, which I most emphatically wish it didn't. I have to reckon with that every day. If we forget a, a moment about race and acknowledge caste, black folks participate and codify each other along with the rest of the world, and in some cases, we can do it better and brutally as well. Billy Paul's 1972 hit, Am I Black Enough For You, often rings in my ears. Here I am, I'm not biracial, but my maternal great-great-granddad wasn't black, and he raped my great-great-grandmother. I then have to hear Florida's governor tell people who don't know what the Civil War was about that slavery was beneficial. Well, yes, I'm here, so that is beneficial. That is why these figures standing here in Golden Gate Park are monumental. Kahindi Wiley said it best recently, I'm an artist and a thinker. So is Dana King, so am I. There are many of us out there, the hated, woke, as far as monumental reckoning is concerned, Dana King achieved something that I brought to her attention when I told her she had decolonized Golden Gate Park. She said, incredulous, 
I did. <laughs> Words like defunding or decolonizing or God forbid you mention reparations. This means somehow white people must lose something so black people and brown people might gain something. No, no, no. Monumental reckoning represents several things for many people. For me, it symbolizes the difficulty of existing as the progeny of a global system of oppression, like that of chattel slavery. People willfully wish to help make tepid this history of slavery from whence I come as insignificant. No, once a slave, your children were, and their children were, and their... The greater world order and the very society that raised you, conditions you, and still oppresses you perpetually ignores and denies its impact or even its existence, and this in turn damages you. Monumental Reckoning illustrates where once stood a 130-year-old monument to a man most contemptible, Francis Scott Key. Now stands 350 ancestors smiling upwards where he who hated no longer is welcome and was disappeared like so many of the black bodies he owned and brutalized. That is monumental. Decolonizing doesn't mean replace. It means to reorder. It means to recalibrate. It means to console the restless furies that force salted moisture from our eyes. Why I must furrow my brow attempting to comprehend the fact that my my father had to risk his own black life to fight for this nation in a segregated military in World War II against tyranny, genocide, and hate in Europe, only to return to it in his homeland. When I asked him, he had no answers except he did what he had to do, and that was all I ever heard about it. When you hear about the book bannings and the don't say gay laws and the expelling of duly elected black young Democrats from Tennessee's state legislature for standing up against guns or a statewide university system denying a living wage to its faculty, you know that it is monumentally difficult to do what Dana King has done here, but she did it. Do it. The fact that the words lift every voice, the first words of our black national anthem are emblazoned above a temple to music in Golden Gate Park is monumental. Looking at our world with the gaze of seeing what I need to see instead of seeing what has simply been put there, that is monumental reckoning. I'd like to close with a quote from the late Buddhist leader, Daisaku Ikeda. The institutions of human society treat us as parts of a machine. They assign us ranks and place considerable pressure upon us to fulfill defined roles. We need something to help us restore our lost and distorted humanity. Each of us has feelings that have been suppressed and have built up inside. There is a voiceless cry resting in the depths of our souls, waiting for expression. Art gives the soul's feelings voice and form. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Mark Allen Davis, that was beautiful. Our next reader, Sheila Smith McCoy, is an award-winning poet, fiction writer, and filmmaker. She's the recipient of the 2020 Muriel Craft Bailey Memorial Prize in Poetry. Please welcome Sheila Smith McCoy. Thank you. Adjust this mic so I can be tall like everybody else. Um, thanks for coming. Thanks for those of you who are here in body and those who are in spirit. Uh, in the collection is a short story. It's my, my story about abortion. You're going to meet this story in the middle, and you're not going to get to the end. Make you buy the book. <laughs> Imagine, if you will, cardinal singing in the background. You're in North Carolina around 1938. The soul stirrers are singing on the radio, and our protagonist who has just learned that she is pregnant, is trying to slip out of the house before her parents find out. Her father is both a minister and a menace, and her mother is a healer. She already knew how to move like a beaten woman, never moving too fast when her father was angry, never raising her voice, never betraying that she felt anything other than fear. She smoothed her clothes until they were perfect. Katie lightly squeezed her hand until they got their purses. On the radio, Sam Cooke was still singing like there really was a God. Outside, the stillness of the cardinals hung in the air like a prophecy. Silence walked with them down the three brick steps out of the house. 
past the rut in the driveway that always held water in the summertime. As the sun flung itself higher in the sky, they walked to their 1950 Chevrolet Fleetline black Cadillac sitting like a man in his stature. Wrong year I gave you earlier. By any measure, Lewis Scott was a small man. He was slightly built and short. He was made even shorter when he walked with his wife who was just shy of six feet tall. All of their children took after her. Even his daughters were taller than him just after they reached puberty. Katie's pale skin also marked his children. Only two of them had any of the undertones of his darkness. They had all betrayed him by taking her waving thick hair. Lena's was the most beautiful. Her hair not even dark enough to be light brown swung when she walked, hitting in the middle of her back even when it was curled. She was dimpled and meek, just the way the Reverend loved a woman to be. Lewis walked behind her to the car, watching for signs of the shame. When he saw Lena rubbing her arm where he had held it, he wanted so badly to beat her to beat her down. But they were in full view of the people of Redsville who were going about their business on Saturday morning. He had a reputation to uphold. There would be time for beating later. He swallowed hard to temper his anger, but he felt the indignation rise in his throat every time he thought about going to the Chavis place to beg their sorry mama's boy to marry his daughter. He opened the car door for Katie and Lena before he slammed it shut. He stood still there, staring at them through the car window, lost in his own thoughts. Lena fucking so no good boy, Katie letting it happen. He stood there clenching and unclenching his fists, the thoughts fueling his anger. He stood there long enough that Lou Jr., his second son, looked up from where he was hooking his mortar mixer to the family's old truck. When he saw his sister's face pressed against the window and the hollow roundness of her eyes, he dropped the mixer right where he stood and ran to the car, reaching it in a few strides. Already over six feet and only 16, Lou Jr. was strong. He was the only one of the house that Lewis feared. Daddy, you need for me to drive you somewhere? His breathing was easy, his voice calm. We're going to Hale Chavis's house to speak with him and his parents. Your sister here is gonna get herself married, ashamed one or the other. Without acknowledging his father's words, Lou Jr. opened the passenger drawer for him, then walked around the car and slid into the driver's seat. He had learned to protect Lena early on, even though he was old enough to have changed his diaper. Lou Jr. searched for Lewis's eyes in the rearview mirror. Lena's eyes in the rearview mirror. She was staring far away at a maple tree, lost perhaps in the troubles of the moment. He wondered how Lena had gotten to and from Hale's place without him knowing. He knew well enough the kind of man Hale Chavis was and the only kind he would ever be. Hale was not his friend, but he had a certain respect for him. He had a car, a 1956 Ford Fairline, and he kept it clean. He worked hard and he played hard. He was not the kind of man that he thought Lena would go for at all. He'd always thought that she would choose someone more like her brothers. They could lay brick, plane and build, plant and pass plaster. The crafts were passed from father to son to sons-in-law. They could build anything, knew how to make their bricks, own bricks if they had to. They had land and they were tethered to it. Leaving was the only on their minds when Lewis's fists made them think of different horizons. The Chavis house was just far enough away to drive. The ride from Old Smithfield Road where they used to live, where Chavis family lived between Highway 55 and West Holly Springs was actually uneventful. The railroad tracks on the side of the road marked their journey, promising safe passage for anyone quick enough to jump onto the northbound train. They looked like a family out for a Saturday ride rather than one searching for redemption on the wrong side of the tracks. No one spoke on the 10 minute drive there. Only the radio broke up the car's quiet. A few minutes after they bumped over the railroad tracks, Lou Jr. turned the car onto the dirt road that led to the Chavis place. They rounded the last curve and parked next to Hale where he stood shining his far lane, fair lane. Hale had his head slightly to the left and opened the door for Lena and her mother. Anybody who knew anything about life would have known what the Scott family had come to do. He helped them both out of the car so he could avoid speaking to Reverend Scott as long as possible. We're here to speak to your parents about you and Lena. Lewis held his hand up to stop Hale from trying to explain anything. Lena would not look at Hale, but she looked everywhere else. I'm gonna skip a little bit uh, to a scene 
They had dinner. It didn't go well. <laughs> Lena rode to the courthouse with her parents and Lou Jr., who hugged her tightly before they went to the office of the Justice of the Peace in Raleigh. Even her sisters came, having borrowed their uncle's car, though the three of them were lost in their separate thoughts about the days that they had left their father's house. They helped Lena get ready, helped her pin her too light to be brown hair up on one side, helped her address her dress so it was well, stopped themselves from telling her to run away before it was too late. Lena was relieved when Hale came just a big late with his parents smiling their apologies. Sharon explained that the Sylvie had to work unexpectedly and couldn't come. Then Lena and Hale said the world that she had dreamed about the night before. They had the reception at the Scotts house where they stayed until dinner time. Lena had never known a happier day. She and Hale walked to the duplex just before dusk. The sky was darkening and marbled, the night warmer than it should have been. She wanted to show Hale that she could be a good wife. So she had gone to their new place early in the morning to cook dinner. All she had to do when she got back was to warm her food and fry her cornbread. She giggled when Hale carried her across the threshold and kissed her lightly on the forehead. Deep down, she had known he was a good man. Well now, Miss Chavis, here we are. He rubbed his hand across her belly the first time he had touched her since she got pregnant. Hale looked in in a way that he had never done before. It was long and lingering look and she thought she had something to do with the first night as husband and wife. She let herself hope it would be gentler than the first time he had forced her, that it would be sweeter than the second time when she had willingly gotten into the back seat of his car. <clears throat> Lena almost skipped into the kitchen to get her cornbread going. She heard the screen door in the back of the apartment screech open, then close. She heard Hale's footfalls moving rapidly across the porch. Somewhere in the distance, she heard Sylvie's laugh Heard the Fairlane's, Fairlane's engine come to life, its muffler always rattling a bit too loud. By the time she got out to the porch, all she saw were the Fairlane's cat-eyed rear lights speeding down the road. Later, she could not remember why she had set the table for two. She would only recall waiting until the crickets took over the night before she realized that Hale might be gone. She would remember eating alone and the tears that fell into her plate thinning the gravy of her peas. You have to buy the book to see what happened next. So I also wanted to read a piece from my uh, poetry collection, The Bones Beneath. It's a Pulitzer and uh, Tufts nominated book. Hopefully I will win. This one is called X. Um, you will need to know that Saba, a Caribbean island, is known for the 800 steps that are carved from the shore of its rocky shore to the top. Here you go, X. You have arrived at the place where X marks the spot. Pass between you will not go despite your doctor's warnings. I have refused to sit vigil for your life. I cannot keep you here. We are at the place where I must watch you fall and fail, travel the sorrowful road alone ahead, or settle for being held together forever by my mother-laden hands. There are no words for some things. Some things must be written in pain. In Saba, they have letters. They leave letters at the crossroads, letters that tell of some secret sin scattering reputations to the wind. We watched Saber rising behind King Kong in a black and white movie, blonde bombshell in his massive doomed hands while waiting for sunrise, sleepless in the lonely hours before dawn. 800 stone steps carved by enslaved hands rise from Saber's rocky shore. I have swam in the island's warm waters, buoyed by gathering waves and happier times. Those steps seemed impossible to climb. I leave your letter on the far corner of the kitchen counter where I do not leave a meal prepared in hope of you eating my version of a truce. I give you words from Langston. There are no smooth, soothing stairs to fairy tales without the bitter singularity of tears on the way to tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. Our uh, next and final reader, Michael War, 
is a San Francisco Public Library laureate and the recipient of many honors and awards, including the Creative Work Fund Award, the Penn Oakland Josephine Miles Award for Excellence in Literature, the Gwendolyn Brooks Significant Illinois Poets Award, and an NEA Fellowship. Please welcome Michael War. Hello, wonderful people. It's good to see all of you here. And it's an honor to have joined, you know, or shared this stage with so many wonderful writers um, and thinkers. I just love the diversity of the, of the voices. You know, we can be black and we can be diverse. Um, so I am, I'm going to share the two poems that are in volume, volume two of Black Fire this time. And the first one is um, one of my first literary heroes. It's a, a praise poem dedicated to Gwendolyn Brooks, uh, who I met in a book. I met her in an anthology, um, 3,000 Years of Black Poetry, when I was in like high school or something like that. And I stole the book. I loved it so much. And uh, someone eventually stole it from me. <laughs> so I hope it went to a guy. I hope it did the same thing for them that it did for me. I eventually became really close friends with Gwendolyn when I moved from San Francisco to, uh, to Chicago. So this is called Her Words for Gwendolyn Brooks. An archaeologist, not a lexicologist, figured it out. The word was a woman mingling among the aromas of Ethiopia. Brandishing a painter's brush in a dig ter territorially defined by string, the archaeologist swept away ancient crust and sediment, finding language alive and agitated instead of the fossilized femur of a long dead Ramapithecus. Words wrapped in rhythm, pleasure, knowledge, and pain, words as sharply defined as an Ashanti sculpture, words of an African dynasty made of peoples not restricted to kings, words that survived the Atlantic, words that survived Atlanta, words that survived migration, segregation, integration, and false resolution, words worn as bracelets, amulets, and weapons, words that were up long before they were down, word up, words that give more than she has taken. Children's lives we weaved first through her poems and then through their own words that could weave a world. And this, um, this next poem is also in volume two, and it's another, it's another praise poem. And this is to, I, I, this was a commission poem actually um, that I was asked to write during the pandemic. Um, and it was for a poet who I did, I, he was also in that book, 3,000 Years of um, Black Poetry, but I was not as, you know, moved by Kim at the time as I was by Gwendolyn. And I didn't really get to know his, his um, work that much, but I think with a lot of these types of experiences, you are being influenced even if you don't know it. Like I was also I, um, asked to write for the, um, anthology on Ferlinghetti. And I said, well, you know, I wasn't particularly influenced by Ferlinghetti directly, but you cannot grow up in San Francisco at that point when I was, you know, in the 70s in high school and not be influenced by the culture of Ferlinghetti. You know, you may not have, he may not have been the poet you were going to. Um, and I think that with, um, with Bob Kaufman, that was a similar experience, you know, that I read him when I was very young, and so he probably had a bigger influence on me than I knew. So um, this poem is also published in volume two called Searching for Bob Kaufman, and um, it's, it was a fun, poem, uh, fun piece for me because I was trying to capture his language, which was very, very different from mine. Hieroglyphic petals illuminate an adolescent trek through the paper fills, flat plains, and edited savannas of 3,000 years of black poetry. The traveling trickster emerges centuries of chapters away from Africa's ancient poets, anonymous, 
spine to spine with those known Wheatley, Dunbar, Brown, Hughes, Brooks, King, Jones, Evans, Giovanni, and Cruz, bound to the sticky fingers of this black boy, seeking non-mystical space between liberation and Ecclesiastes. He never knew this sometimes speaking in tongue saxophonious poet, except through sorcery etched in ether and improbable perfect juxtapositions and mind-bending visions manifest in maddening unmarked stone and gravity-defined language turning the underground upside down. In silence deafening to those who want to listen, in sonic waves of syllables soothing the soul of blue wells, in explosive lines fueled by heavy water, in inaudible beats drowning out fascistic love ends, in inescapable jail breaks that from forced criminality, in masses of massive solitude out in the open, in iterations blocking unblocked iteration and revelatory sacred acts of resistance inside the mind of a Milky Way, a black hole absorbed our light to be enlightened. Okay, I forgot to turn on my timer, but I'm gonna end with one more, <laughs> one more poem. And, um, this is a poem that, let me see if I have it here. Hmm. This is a poem that, I, again, it was a, permission, a commissioned poem that I was asked to write during the pandemic. And um, it's a poem that is based on a mural on Clarion Alley that is uh, based on a, um, it's called the Arab Liberation Mural and includes a translation of the iconic Tunisian poem, The Will to Leave, to Live, excuse me, and is part of the um, Wall and Response series that featured poets and artists responding to that mural. So I was one of the, the poets who was assigned that, that particular mural. And this is the piece that I wrote. And I just want to proceed it by saying that the um, Israeli newspaper, um, Hares, I think it's pronounced, uh, has recently announced that over 40,000 people have been killed in, in, in Gaza. So I want to dedicate this to both the captives as well as the people who have uh, those 40,000 lives that were lost. It's called This Is More Than a Wall. Dreams escape our mouths at the velocity of hornets fleeing fire. Beneath the surface of our calloused and cultivated skin, we repel apartheid tagging, whitewashed aerosol sprayed in praise of uniformed knees on our neck. In the streets, olive groves, buffer zones, chains of cells, labyrinths of garroting laws or barrel of an Uzi. In the ceaseless, creaseless invasion of every crease of life. All of this that you excrete will be washed away along with the American gifted weaponry by the unrelenting reign of resistance and the threat of eventual peace. You may momentarily obscure the obvious by spraying over bribery, bribery with treachery, hiding truth with thickets of lies. Still, even your stomach turns silently knowing that oppression nourishes its own demise through the gut wrenching loss of innocence, the strangling of simple movement, the daily dismantling of hope, dictating the most basic things that humans cannot do. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Let's give another round of applause for all the readers today, our fabulous readers. There's still some time in the program, and now we hope you'll join us for a uh, book signing and book sales at the table on your right. Uh, we have copies of Blackfire Volume, this time Volume 2, and also other books by today's presenters. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>